Um, okay. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar provided by the Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women Campus Programs and the Cleary Center for Security on Campus, which focuses on covering what you need to know regarding the 2013 VAWA amendments to G the Gene Cleary Act. Presenting today from the Cleary Center will be Allison Kiss, Executive Director, and Abigail Boyer, Assistant Executive Director of Programs, Outreach, and Communications. I'm Amy Guthrie, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's session. I will be monitoring questions and providing technical assistance as needed. Um, so feel free to raise your hand if you need assistance using the um, hand icon on the side top left toolbar. Um, also, uh, we encourage you to type any questions throughout the webinar into the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we will try to get to the questions and we will be pausing throughout the session to answer questions, but we'll also have an additional Q&A session at the end um, to cover any questions that we couldn't get to earlier. Um, we'll also be providing um, a list of the resources that we um, mentioned throughout the webinar and also we'll try to include a compiled report of the questions and answers as well as the recording um, after the session. So that will all be sent out in an email this afternoon. And if any of you um, did not receive a copy of the slides, we did send out, um, we did send out an email earlier with it. If for any reason you did not, um, feel free, I will put my contact information in the chat box. Um, feel free to just send me an email and I can send that to you while we're in session. Um, and let's see, I believe that was all I had. Um, now I'll open it up to Abby and Allie to get started. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amy. And this is Allison Kiss. I'm the executive director of the Cleary Center. Um, Abby and I ha have both presented on this topic separately and together. So we look forward to um, discussing with you. We were really thrilled as a technical assistance provider for Office on Violence Against Women to partner with them to provide this not only to campus program grantees, but also to the higher education community. So some of you in during this presentation um, are really approaching this. You maybe have been awarded a grant from the Office on Violence Against Women and you're looking at how to implement this. And others of you just from the higher education committee are or the higher education community are looking as to how the amendments are going to affect your compliance and your programs. Um, I also encourage you if you're interested in applying for an OVW grant, which is OVW stands for Office on Violence Against Women. Um, that was one of the questions we've received. If you're interested in applying for one of those grants or learning more about that program, I encourage you to do some. It's, it's a really great way to um, attempt to institutionalize policies and procedures and programs specific to violence prevention. A little bit about the Cleary Center. We were founded in 1987 by Howard and Connie Cleary as a result of the rape and murder of their daughter Jean by another student on her campus whom she did not know. We've been through many iterations through the years, but currently we are focused on advocacy, training and technical assistance for college and university campuses, we do some work in peer education and prevention education for high school students and college students, Cleary Act training programs, and we also have worked with some partners, including the Victims' Rights Law Center in Boston on Title IX Cleary training and that intersection. Our presentation agenda for today, we are going to tackle the Cleary Act updates. So VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act amendments to the Cleary Act. And some folks call that Campus Save informally but the formal name or as passed is, are the VAWA amendments to Cleary. We're also gonna talk about common mistakes in Cleary Act implementation. And then we're gonna give you some strategies for collaborating to comply. A summary of the Gene Cleary Act requirements, and we can do this in a day and a half training, but we're giving you the short version for the big picture for those who may not have as much knowledge about the act. There's the annual security report. The annual security report is something that is published um, October 1st every year, and it's also required, the, the information is required to go to the Department of Education. That includes crime statistics, and I think that most people, when they think about Cleary, they think about the stats. And while that is a piece of it, it really is truly only a small piece of it. The other piece are statements of policy, and the statements of policy are essentially the cliff notes of your full policies. So your annual security report should have abridged versions of your policies that if you were to go and look at the full policies, you could find more information. 
the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, which we'll talk about quite in depth today, which affords certain rights to students who report sexual assaults. There's an ongoing disclosure provision. So that includes timely warnings, um, issuing warning if there's a current or ongoing threat to student safety or camp or community safety, a public crime log that should be made available to um, anyone who does request it, and then emergency notification provisions, which are the newest provisions um, passed in the 2008 amendments to Clery, which um, extend beyond the timely warning piece to require um, to warn in not only with Clery crimes, but to warn if there's any kind of threat to um, health and safety, um, if there's a weather emergency um, and an outbreak of some sort of disease on campus. The US Department of Education enforces the Clery Act. And currently, um, the fine is $35,000 per violation um, if the campus is found in noncompliance. Some more on the law. Um, it was originally passed in 1990 as part of the Student Right to Know or the Campus Security Act. And then the amendments were in 92, which is the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights that we discussed briefly. In 98, it was amended again, and that's when it was renamed the Gene Cleary Act. And then in 2008, um, was the most recent time it had been amended. And if you want to look at the specific statutes, they're listed there. And the most, the, the most recent final rules were published in October 2009. Um, so the 2008 amendments after negotiated rulemaking, they published the, those final amendments. And that's a good place to start because one thing that we should say before going into this webinar is that although the VAWA amendments have passed and will amend Cleary, there's a process called negotiated rulemaking. So that's, those are meetings at the Department of Education. They are public. They're in January, February, and the end of March. It should be completed by April 1st. And what happens is a, a team of negotiators is brought in by the Department of Education. And these are people who are nominated from various constituencies. Um, the Cleary Center will have someone there. Um, and we sit with others and we will talk about the provisions in that were included that were passed and really then from there write out the rules. So some of the specifics. So you may have some questions that we're going to tell you we can't answer right now because they're truly going to depend on rulemaking. And I throw that out too as a caveat in terms of if someone is trying to tell you they know what's in save or they have a list or um, you know, they want to sell you a checklist or information or something specific, I would really, really caution you to wait until you find out what the specific rules are. The next slide is um, the Sex Offense Policy Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights that's specific to Cleary. And we have these R's with circles around them. That is required by law. So we often at our organization talk about the letter and the spirit of the law. Well, this is strictly the letter. And to be quite honest, a lot of these pieces to me also embrace the spirit because it was, it's what we should afford anyone who reports a sexual assault on our campus. We are to have educational programs to prevent sex offenses. And this is from the 92 amendments. This is one component that has been amended and Abby will talk more specifically on what that is starting to look like. And, and that's really looking at some evidence-based approaches. Right now, what is required is that you have to have programs. And it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not they're, there's they're rooted in evidence. So, so it's nice to see that that will be updated to reflect the times. Um, the next ones, uh, procedures to follow when a sex offense occurs. So there are specific procedures in terms of notification of a forensic exam um, or certain rights afforded to a, a victim who reports an option to notify law enforcement and assistance with that notification. So if you were notifying law enforcement offering that student um, what their options are there and also saying we can help you um, as a campus notify law enforcement. N notification of on or off campus services. So notification of what services you have on campus as well as what services you have off campus. And that may be through some partnerships and we'll talk about partnerships quite a bit through here. But if you're not connected with your local victim service organization, connect with them. It's a great resource, even if it's just another place to offer students to go. Change of academic and living situation, if it's reasonable. So if a student has a request or you offer a student a an option to move their living situation, they may want to leave 
um, or move their living situation because maybe the assault happened in their residence hall, maybe it happened in a, a room in their residence hall that wasn't theirs, or maybe there's just some trauma uh, associated with that building in some way. So you always want to give, you don't never want to assume is the key piece, you always want to give that option to switch. Campus disciplinary procedures. So um, this really mirrors Title IX, um, prompt and equitable. So making sure that those, um, that hearing is fair, that you afford the, the same rights for to have people present. If you're going to offer five people for one, you have to offer it for the other. And then also has to include sanctions following a final determination. If you do not have all your sanctions listed out in exhaustive lists, it doesn't, it file suit, follow suit with Cleary or Title IX. So you cannot say sanctions to be determined. You have to list everything that could be a potential sanction, which also protects you from any of those quote unquote special cases where it's a high profile athlete or scholar or something of that nature who has been accused and you don't want their sentence to be minimized, their sanction to be minimized. You want it to be um, really in line with everything else you do. So those of you who sometimes may um, feel that you get that pressure from administration, if you have this exhaustive list, it's a way to say this is the list we need to follow. Next, we're going to look at some of the Clery Act updates. So we're going to look at Save Act history. Um, we're also going to look at preliminary guidance from the Department of Education and then the elements of the law pre-rulemaking. And I'll say that a number of times because you, we want to wait for that rulemaking process to get the specifics. To that end, um, the Campus Save Act is Section 304 of the Violence Against Women Act. So it's a violent, VAWA amendments to Cleary is a formal name, Section 304 of VAWA. And again, I think it has just kept the name Campus Save because Campus Save was first introduced in 2010 and continued and didn't go away, to be quite honest, for many years. Uh, quite honestly, because it made sense. It made sense because it covers not only students, but staff of an institution. And we should, we should have um, provisions in place to protect those staff who report. And then it's the most dramatic expansion because it also includes, it expands the 92 amendments, the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, to include dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. Some of the preliminary guidance from the Department of Education I've talked about the negotiated rulemaking process. If any of that isn't clear, I encourage you, and I know Amy talked about the question tab, to type some questions in because you, you should understand that process. And again, that process should end by April 2014. And then the final rules will probably be published a couple of months after that. Um, when those final regulations come out, that's when you'll have all of the specifics. However, the Department of Education has said for October 2014, they want you to make a good faith effort to include statistics for three preceding calendar years. So what does that mean? Well, that means they're asking you to go back before the law was passed and see if you can gather that data. So that's why they're using that good faith effort term. And we've heard that actually directly from the Department of Education, um, that, that their intention is not to go out and enforce this in that first year and slap fines on institutions but their intention is to have you start to think about this. And many of you probably already are. Um, if you have a campus program grant, you have to, because you have to have these types of protocols in place. And if you don't, you probably have had students, unfortunately, who have reported stalking, domestic violence, or dating violence. And really think about your policies you have in place already. And when we go through some of the sample pieces for the policy statements that Abby will talk about, you can really look and see if they're in line with that. So as I, as I mentioned, with the statistics piece, it's going to expand um, Cleary to include domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. How that is collected is not clear yet and will come after negotiated rulemaking. I can say there has been some rumbling that it will be similar to how hate crimes are collected and hate crimes are um, written in a narrative form. Um, so I, I would start to look that way if I had to give you some, some pieces of advice, but again, that's not 100%. The definitions that are provided, and you should have received these slides. If you did not, you are going to receive a recording of this webinar after, as well as the slides. But the definitions come from the Violence Against Women Act. 
So we've included them in each slide. Um, domestic violence, um, which can include felony or misdemeanor crimes of violence committed by a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the victim. A person with whom the victim shares a child in common by a person who is cohabitating or, um, or who has cohabitated with the victim as a spouse by a person similar, similarly situated to a spouse of the victim under the domestic or family violence, violence laws of the jurisdiction receiving the grant monies. So these are the VAWA, and I'm not going to read the whole definition, but these are the VAWA definitions. So I would keep these in place and also understand how they match what your state laws. And this is where your state coalition against domestic violence or your state domestic violence coalition may come in helpful with some of the interpretations. And we've been in contact and also trained many state coalitions about how to start to think about this specific to campus. The next definition is the dating violence definition, which certainly um, differs quite a bit from domestic violence. And I know there's been a lot of um, questions in the domestic violence piece about the cohabitation. And you know, a common question we get, will roommate conflicts, all roommate conflicts now be considered domestic or dating violence? And, and the answer is no, the, um, certain through the rulemaking process, that will come up and there'll be some way to distinguish that. Um, and then stalking is our last definition. Um, and, and the term stalking there has to cause a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety or the safety of others and suffer substantial emotional distress. The one piece about stalking that I also think is going to come up during the rulemaking is the cyber stalking piece. We've had quite a few um, questions specific to, we had a webinar just before this on the same topic. And a lot of the questions were um, centered around cyber stalking or online classrooms and what that will look like. Many of you are probably representing bricks and mortar campuses. However, a lot of those campuses have taken on some online courses. So what do we do if a student is in the online courses and they report a crime? Or if a student is a hybrid student and they're taking some in-class, in, on-campus or online courses? So I think these are things that are going to have to be considered. And I would really uh, encourage you to start to consider because, again, they are your students. So if you have a student online who's reporting um, cyber stalking or some sort of victimization, what type of services can you have for them? Can you even start to just put some resources um, on your web page now or on the Blackboard site where they go to do their classes now um, as a resource for them? And I'm going to pass on to Abby as we go to the next slide to specify some of the uh, pieces of the policy statements. Thank you. And I just want to answer some questions that were coming in as Allison was talking. One of the questions were, was regarding the sanctions imposed and whether that information needs to be within the annual security report. And the answer to that is, yeah, is yes. You would have that information within your policy statement and the annual security report. And then, of course, if there is a policy statement, you must also have an aligning policy. So that would be included in your policy as well. Another question was um, the dates for final regulations and when when we would get that information. We don't have specific information as to when that will be shared with all of us, but negotiating rulemaking, as Allison mentioned, will be in January, February, and March. So the final regulations would come out sometime after that point, likely within a few months. We're fortunate in that we get a lot of phone calls from colleges and universities across the country, and particularly after we saw the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, we were getting a lot of calls from institutions who were asking, we know that this is coming down the pike, what do we need to know, how do we implement this? Um, and one of the things that we saw in having those phone calls is sometimes people would give us a call and they would say, well, now that we know this information, we recognize that we're doing a lot of these things already. So for some of you, you might be in a place where you look at some of these things that I'm about to share and you recognize, okay, we already have um, a lot of these um, items in place. We're already doing this on our campus. For some other institutions who may not already um, the approaching domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking in some of the ways that we're going to discuss. They've really used the new um, requirements as an opportunity to build multidisciplinary teams on their, um, at their institutions. So if that's not something that's happening on your campus, I would encourage you to look at how that could take place. We know that this is a really valuable time to be able to do that because it's a time where you can bring people to the table and say, look, we know that we have these new requirements. We want to make sure that we're doing them well. And here's who needs to be around the table. And here's what we need to discuss in order to do that. 
there are a couple of different um, pieces that I'm going to go through as to the policy statements that will be required within your annual security report. And then, of course, the policies that will be needed to be implemented on campus. The first is description of programs to prevent domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And this is one of the pieces that um, we're particularly excited about. Both Allison and I have background working for county victim service organizations prior to coming to the Cleary Center. And education is a piece that's extremely important to us. And we know that it's important to many of you participating in this webinar. And I'm going to go through in detail some of the additional requirements related to what those programs will need to look like on your campus. But recognize that this is an opportunity to really take a comprehensive look at what your institution is offering and where you might introduce not just some of these new requirements, but where you can really look at how you evaluate the programs that you're doing and whether or not the work that you're doing is as effective as you'd like it to be. There's also requirements related to institutional procedures followed once an incident of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking has been reported. And going back to what Allison shared earlier, remember that this is something that your institutions are already doing. Since 1992, you've had that Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights. And within this Bill of Rights, you have those requirements as to procedures and what that needs to look like. So that includes information about whom to contact, preserving evidence, and how to make a report so that no matter what, if an incident does occur, that that student, or in this case, um, staff also, uh, or employee also knows um, who they can report to and where there are support services on the campus. Um, some of the other pieces might include change or do include change in academic or living situation. You know that we've seen that for sexual assault since 1992. We've seen that extended now to, to victims of domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, and extended even further beyond just academic and living to also include transportation and working. As I mentioned, there are um, some significant changes to the types of prevention that is done on campus. So up to this point, institutions have already been required to provide educational programs around sexual assault, both forcible and non-forcible sex offenses. What we see now with the changes is an additional requirement for primary prevention and awareness programs for all incoming students and new employees addressing issues around domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So what does that mean? Up until this point, a lot of um, institutions or a lot of people providing education were really focusing their efforts on awareness and resources. So talking about the fact that these crimes do occur even within our campus communities and sometimes unfortunately more often within our campus communities and talking about how to connect with resources. And we know that that dialogue is critically important because the more that we talk about it, the more that we have awareness about these issues, the more that we are discussing the resources available and making sure that people know how to connect with those resources, that is going to connect to whether or not people feel comfortable coming forward and reporting these crimes because they're confident in the response that they'll receive. That said, just talking about the issues and talking about resources isn't enough because we want the, the end goal would be to prevent these crimes from occurring in the first place. So primary prevention, if that's a new term for you, if primary prevention and bystander intervention isn't something that you've typically talked about in the past or something that you've addressed in the past, I would really encourage you to connect with some of the, the many resources out there talking about why primary prevention is important. And essentially what it does is it really works to improve knowledge and attitudes that correspond to these issues of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault and stalking. So it looks at social norms that support violence. It introduces conversations about gender roles and consent. What does consent look like? What does it truly mean to be getting consent from a partner? And also healthy relationships. It connects to skill building so that the individuals within our campus community recognize what a healthy relationship looks like and they have tools for really connecting in a healthy way with their peers and with their partners. So ultimately, primary prevention looks to stop violence before the victimization occurs. 
So within the policy statement and um, within the, the new amendments to Clery, there is that requirement to incorporate primary prevention, and that includes an institutional prohibition against domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. It includes definitions under state law and definition of consent. So having those conversations about consent and what, um, what these really mean and the fact that domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking are unacceptable within your campus community and including options for bystander intervention and information and information on risk reduction. So it's really talking to the campus and providing them tools to handle these situations because so many times, whether it's as adults or whether it's students on a campus, we are going to see scenarios, we're going to be in environments where something is happening that's making us uncomfortable. Maybe it's someone who's giving drink after drink after drink to a partner to a date for the night and you know that um, to you that that doesn't, that's not comfortable. Or maybe you see someone getting aggressive with their partner or putting down their partner. Um, students have these experiences. As adults, we have these experiences. So the goal is to make sure that students and employees have tools in order to respond to that and to change the culture and to change the environment around them. So if you have not already, this is a great opportunity to connect with some of your local and state resources. For example, yesterday I was on a resource panel um, with some county agencies who were talking about what they do around domestic violence and sexual assault. And one of the county domestic violence agencies mentioned to me that they actually have already started a partnership with some local colleges and universities who've reached out to them and said, look, we know that you're doing some primary prevention around this work. How can we incorporate that into to our campus, what tools could you offer us in order um, to make these changes? So a lot of times there are organizations and agencies that are doing this type of work many times for free. Another one of the um, presenters yesterday joked that their informal model, or excuse me, motto is if you ask, we'll be there. So a lot of times it may just be the difference of picking up the phone and saying, hey, what do you have available? Um, how could you really help us in this effort? It also could mean reaching out to some of the other organizations, such as the Stalking Resource Center has a model campus stalking policy that I know they mentioned that they're updating to include the changes to the Violence Against Women Act in relation to the, the campus requirements. So they have tools related to stalking that are available online, and they have a lot of information to share. Green Dot and Men Can Stop Rape, both of who are also technical assistance providers with the OVW campus program, they have a lot of valuable resources. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center has um, pages of bystander intervention resources and ideas. So recognize that it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to reinvent the wheel, but what it does mean is taking a look at what are you already implementing on your campus and how do we incorporate some of these other requirements and some of these themes such as bystander intervention and primary prevention into what we're already doing. So institutions are also required, in addition to having programs initially for incoming students, they're required to offer ongoing prevention and awareness campaigns for students and faculty that address these issues as well. And we just had um, a webinar an hour or two ago that, were that was talking about these issues. And one of the questions and comments that came in from one of the colleges or universities, which I really appreciated, is he said, this is something that needs to be happening year long. It can't just be that somebody is really engaged during National Campus Safety Awareness Month in September, and that's all of the conversations that you're having. That's where education ends. And that's really the end goal of these new requirements related to education, is to really make sure that your institution is having a year-long conversation, that no matter what, people have information as to how to access these resources. So here on the screen in front of you, you can get a glimpse of just some of the programs that when we go, when we travel across the country and we do training um, throughout the United States, here are just some of the things that people have been sharing with us as we um, as we train. And you note that they're very different. So what education looks like really might vary from institution to institution. So a good question to ask would be, what are we already doing? Do we know all of the programs that are in place on our campus at this point? And how might we incorporate, if we're not already doing primary prevention, which I know a lot of you are, how can we incorporate that into some of the things that we're already doing? So you don't have to change everything, but it's recognizing how maybe some of your existing programs can truly evolve. 
Now, within the uh, policy statements, there's also a new requirement that the annual security report must describe the rights of victims and institutions' responsibilities regarding orders of protection, no contact orders, restraining orders, or similar lawful orders issued by a criminal, civil, or tribal court. So what that means is having an understanding of what those types of orders look like within your state. So, for example, um, we're based in Pennsylvania, even though we're a national organization, and Pennsylvania has protection from abuse orders. So it's important that colleges or universities within this particular state have an understanding of what that means, how someone would would obtain a protection from abuse order, and how the institution, um, what role the institution plays in really um, implementing that and helping to support the the state safety of that particular survivor or that victim. There are also requirements related to disciplinary. And Abby, just to. Go right ahead. Oh, oh sorry. I'm so... This is Allison. I just wanted to chime in. Somebody sent a great resource. We have Laura from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. And since you mentioned them, she actually sent the link um, for their primary prevention uh, and bystander intervention report. So I put that in the chat section and you can it can be clicked on and downloaded. Uh, so all attendees should have, should receive that. Oh, wonderful. That's great. And thank you for sharing that. And as I mentioned, with disciplinary proceedings, we're seeing some changes. I want to um, emphasize that when I use the terms accuser and accused, I'm doing so because that is the language um, that we see within um, the, the statutes itself. So I just want to be clear as to where that language is being introduced. Um, but the VAWA amendments also mandate specific elements of the conduct process process in cases involving domestic violence, dating, violence, sexual assault, or stalking, including a prompt and equitable investigation and resolution. So for those of you who are familiar with Title IX, you'll know that that's, that's um, similar language to what we see with Title IX. Uh, one of the pieces that I think is, is very important is that they, the um, training, or excuse me, the investigation and resolution um, and individuals who hear cases need to be trained in issues related to sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And the reason that I think that's so important, and probably many of you can identify this challenge as well, is that many times survivors can have counterintuitive responses. So maybe they don't um, report right away for a number of different reasons. Um, maybe, for example, if someone's asking them questions, they giggle or laugh because they're uncomfortable. Um, we never know how someone's going to respond. For example, in my prior job, if I would be going to a hospital to meet someone for a sexual assault forensic exam, I could walk into that room and they might want to talk about what just happened to them. They might want to not talk about what just, hap what just happened. They might be crying. They might be angry. They might want to talk about what happened on Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And every single one of those responses is incredibly normal. And um, fortunately, I know many, if not all of you on this webinar really recognize that, but it's incredibly important that the officials who are hearing cases also have an understanding of these dynamics because only then can we see that equitable um, response and only then can we really have an investigation and a hearing process that does protect the safety of the victim and pr promote accountability. And in addition to that, the accuser and accused are entitled to the same opportunities to have other present, others present, as well as um, both the accuser and the accused need to be simultaneously informed in writing of the outcome of any disciplinary proceeding that arises um, from, what, from an allegation, the institution's procedures for the accused and the victim to appeal the results of the institutional disciplinary proceeding, any change in the results before they come final, and when the results become final. And most notable in this is the appeals process because we want to make sure that the, that the students are aware of the outcome because say, for example, um, the accused is suspended from campus, but then throughout the appeal process, they are now permitted back on campus. If the um, victim in this particular case doesn't know that that change has been made and comes to campus and runs into that person, I'm sure we can all recognize how, um, how traumatic that could be for that person. Another requirement is in relation to written information. So it requires that any student or employee who reports that um, a crime has occurred, that one of these crimes has occurred, is provided a written explanation of the rights and options for victims. So this really 
provides an opportunity for institutions to create a guide, to create information that is accessible, that they can easily understand, and that clearly outlines all of their different options, both confidential options, non-confident um, options that are not confidential, and really making sure that they have something tangible that they can take with them as they decide what they want to do moving forward. Because we know that you could sit with someone for a number of hours, you could sit down and go through an exhaustive list of all of the different options that are available to them. But following a trauma, they may need some time to really think about what's best for them. And things that are shared with them verbally, they might not always be able to retain as easily as they're really sitting down and figuring out what they're going to do moving forward. So having that type of resource can really give them the option to sit and go through within their own time, within their own space, um, to figure out what is best for them. Because we know that that's not a decision that any of us can make. That's really only a decision that the survivor himself or herself can make. And it's useful to have this information in multiple locations. We also wanted to talk a little bit about the intersection of the Cleary Act and Title IX, one, because we saw a lot of the language um, or some of the language was pulled from Title IX and from the requirements that we see there, um, and also because there are some very clear intersections. Now, if you're not as familiar with Title IX, we know that it is a federal civil rights law that prevents discrimination on the basis of sex. And what we know from the guidance that we've received from the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights is that that includes sexual harassment and sexual violence. So it requires an institution to take action once they know or should reasonably know of possible sexual harassment or sexual violence that creates a hostile environment. They then must take immediate and appropriate steps to eliminate the sexual harassment or violence, prevent its recurrence, investigate to determine what occurred and take appropriate steps to resolve the situation. So some of the places where we see intersection between Cleary and Title IX are one, the disclosure of policies and procedures, um, prompt corrective action. So some of the corrective action that we see both under Cleary and Title IX could be a change in academic or living situation, because we know that oftentimes, as Allison mentioned, the, the person who committed the offense, the offender, could be in that person's residence hall, or they could be in that person's classroom. Um, so making these changes. And then again, with the changes to VAWA, we saw that extended to transportation and working. The accused and the accuser must be notified of the outcome in the same manner and in the same time frame. And under Title IX, we know that both parties need to be notified in writing. And also, we see an overlap in the fact that the, that the institution needs to disclose the sanction imposed. Um, and under Title IX, the institution must take interim protective measures while that investigation is taking place to address that hostile environment. So Clery Act and Title IX really should foster collaboration. And in some of the conversations that we've had with colleges and universities, we've seen that they're having, there are some places that are having some struggle where they feel as though there are conflicts between the two. And if that's the case, if you're having some um, concerns with that, we would really encourage you to reach out to us and some of the other um, wonderful organizations that provide information about this because ultimately there is opportunity for the two to work together. Other, but it's critical that the police and security department have a relationship with the Title IX coordinator. We don't want to have a situation where really we're operating in silos and campus police isn't communicating as well as they could with student affairs. Um, campus judicial isn't a part of the conversation. We need to have multidisciplinary, um, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach in order for not just Cleary compliance to be effective, but also compliance with a number of different laws. Because unfortunately, we've we've heard situations where people say, well, you know, we've really embraced Cleary and we do Cleary really well, but we feel as though Title IX is falling by the wayside or vice versa. So we need to recognize that there are a number of different laws that come into play, like Cleary, like Title IX, like FERPA, and all of them are equally as important and all of them need to be addressed. But in order to do that, we all need to be in the same room and having the same conversation. We also wanted to take some time during this webinar to focus on some common mistakes in Cleary compliance that we've seen, because as I mentioned, a lot of institutions are using these changes as an opportunity to really take a comprehensive look at what is available on their campus, what their institution is doing, and what needs to be changed. 
so we're sharing some of these common mistakes so that you can really have some tools for sitting down in a group and identifying, okay, where do we stand with some of these other areas where some colleges and universities have had challenges. So the first is failure to report crimes based on proper geography. So we know that there are specific geography when it comes to Clery compliance. We have on-campus, that buildings and property on campus. We have non-campus, so the buildings owned or controlled um, by the institution that are not within that on-campus area or buildings that are owned or controlled by um, a student organization that's recognized by that institution. We have public property requirements. And then there's also the requirements that um, you share statistics that occurred within the residence hall in both on campus and within its own category. So some of the problem areas that we've seen in relation to non-campus building and property is one, identifying what the non-campus property is. So it's really important that institutions are taking the time to review the buildings and review the contracts that the institution owns and controls um, or are used to directly support the university programs to identify where th these locations are and what falls within your non-campus building and property category. Another would be within public property, we've seen both over and under reporting. So where we see over reporting is where, um, where institutions have failed to identify what their public property um, requirements are, or we have also seen um, some places where they're identifying private buildings that are being used by the public as public property. Um, so really taking a look at that is important. And then lastly, with separate campuses, we've seen institutions, and this, this, all of this information are things that we see not only in the work that we do as an organization, that the Cleary Center does in, as an organization, but all of these um, common mistakes in Cleary implementation are really pulled from the program reviews that the Department of Education has done. Um, so with separate campuses, institutions fail to report for separate or branch campuses. And recognizing that if you have a separate campus, each campus needs to comply independently with the requirements. So they would have their own annual security report. So some of the questions that come into play here is whether that campus has an organized program of study, um, is there a distinct administrative unit, budgetary and hiring, authority? Um, do they have a level of autonomy? These are some of the questions that, that you should be asking as you look at your own geography to figure out if maybe there are places that you need to be taking a closer look at. The next one is lack of or inadequate policy statements. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, one thing that sounds obvious but is really important to take a look at is whether you not only have policy statements included within your annual security report, but whether those policy statements in turn have policies to support that. And you also want to take a look at whether or not the policies that you do have in place and the policy statements that you do have in place accurately describe what you do on your campus. With timely warnings and emergency notification, you want to make sure that you do have two separate um, policies for timely warning and emergency notification. They are, um, they do have separate requirements, so making sure that that information is including, included. Excuse me, reporting crimes. So making sure that it's included within your annual security report and that your campus knows to whom to make a report um, if an incident does occur on campus and also um, information about how to access some of those support services. For sexual assault policies, making sure that all of the different requirements are included. So Allison reviewed the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights. All of those different pieces should be included within your sex offense policy. So this is something that as you're creating policies or looking at your policies in relation to the VAWA changes, here's something that you want to take a look at, that not only do you have policies in place, but do they cover all of the different um, areas that are included within the amendment. For crime prevention and, and awareness programs, making sure that you have information, not just the title of them, but a description of what that means, that you're including the type and the frequency so that the campus community can understand really what that looks like and what that means. And also relationship with law enforcement. So whether or not um, you have a, an MOU in place, a law enforcement memorandum of understanding in place with local law enforcement should be included. 
The next one is failure to publish and distribute the ASR as a comprehensive document. So we know that a lot of times you might have information within your annual security report in other locations, and that is okay to have information in multiple places, but you want to make sure that when you're sharing that ASR, um, that that annual security report is a comprehensive document. So it shouldn't have to be that people have to look in one place for statistics, they have to look in another place for the policy statements, they all should be together in one comprehensive document. So, um, and another, another thing related to the annual security report is that your annual fire safety report may be included in that document, or you may choose to have it um, separately. However, if you do choose to separate the two, you want to make sure that you have information as to how to directly access that report. And as Allison mentioned earlier, there is that October 1st deadline. And if you um, choose to post your annual security report on, online, you still want to make sure that that notice is out by October 1st. And that would include a notice of availability, the exact URL where that report can be accessed, a description of the contents within the annual security report, and also information that a paper copy will be available if requested. And then lastly, inadequate systems for collecting statistics. So this is a place where a lot of colleges and universities are really taking a look at how do we identify the campus security authorities on our campus um, and how are we providing them with information? So just to jump forward for just a moment, we know that campus security authorities are not just campus police and campus security. It's officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities. So that could be someone like a coach um, or a dean of students, somebody who's working closely with students in that capacity. Individuals or offices designated to receive crime reports. So if you list them within your annual security report as an individual or office to whom people can make a report, then you are making them a campus security authority. Campus police or campus security are obviously also campus security authorities. And also individuals who have responsibility for campus security. So that could be RAs or access monitors. So you want to make sure that you're taking a look um, and making sure that you're identifying who are the campus security authorities within our particular campus and how do we prepare them for this role? Do we provide training? Do we provide them with reporting forms to help clarify what needs to be shared? Do we have a process on our campus and procedures on our campus for collecting reportable incidents? When it goes back to that good faith effort to collect from local police, documentation is key as well. So we know that you're requesting um, that statistical information from the local police. Some institutions have really great relationships with local police and they're providing them with that information. They've given them that request. They've provided the geographic areas that they need um, the information for, and that local police is providing them with the statistics and with the information. There are others that have faced some challenges in getting that information from local police. So if that's the case, make sure, in any case, make sure that you're documenting that proof of request, that you're showing, here's how we reached out to them. You know, if you did it by phone, documenting the day and how you did it, I would always encourage also doing a request, a written request by email. Um, so making sure that you have some documentations about doing that outreach. So if for some reason a program review would take place, you can say, we didn't receive the statistics from them, but here is all of the different ways that we made a good faith effort to, to get that information. And then lastly, with incident reports, making sure that um, writers really do have training on the Clery Act, that they recognize that it is beyond just the counting of statistics, because we know that, that those reports are also linked to other requirements, such as whether or not the information is included within the daily crime log, it's connected to information, it's um, connected to requirements regarding um, emergency notification and timely warning. So really making sure that people are informed and trained so that they can provide the accurate information as quickly as possible. And so all of those different reasons, all of those compliance challenges is why compliance with Clery, as we see with some of these other laws as well, is really an institutional responsibility. It can't fall on the shoulders of one person in campus police because reports come from a number of different places. And there also will need to be collaboration between these requirements to make sure that all of your bases are covered. So if you haven't at, until this point had the chance to really be around the same table and be talking about what information is shared, we hope that the 
the amendments included within VAWA will give you the motivation to really start those conversations and to bring all of those folks to the table. And here's just a summary of some of the compliance challenges that we talked about. It really truly does need to be a top-down, bottom-up effort in order to be in compliance, not just with the existing regulations, but with some of the other regulations coming down the pike. And we have some questions that come in that I think really um, touch on. And what we've been doing is answering, since we have so many attendees, we've been answering many of them privately, but I think some are good and worth repeating. So that's why Abby and I are picking some of those out. One is, if a victim reaches out to a counselor, what action must occur? Notification of public safety. And you only need to, if that counselor is privileged by state statutory, has, has privilege, then they do not need to pass the information on. However, you can have a voluntary confidential reporting. So reporting then is voluntary and it's confidential. So if the student, the client of that says, I would like campus safety to know this happened, just the number, not many of the details or if any of the details, then that can be passed on. But they are not mandated to break any type of confidentiality. The only reason they would be is if you have all your crimes reported, if you know in your report that all crimes should be reported to counselors. Um, I don't know any campuses that do that, but if you made them a campus security authority by doing that. Um, but, but again, you want to make sure you keep those confidential places where students can go to report. The other question I wanted to bring up, just based on what Abby was talking about, for the investigation at, for an institution that does not have campus police, do they have to call the local police departments to take over the investigation? And again, you have to give the option to notify law enforcement. So the student reporting may not want to notify law enforcement. The only reason you would not abide by that is if there is some law specific to your state, and I think there is a law in Wisconsin that if it goes to a public state, public safety department, they automatically have to report it to their local jurisdiction. Um, but otherwise, you want to stick with the options and with what the choice of the student reporting is. Um, this, la this last slide here, or, or one of these slides here, one of the last few slides, we put up, it's from our U U.S. attorney, uh, Zane Meminger, and one of the things he talks about is that the Cleary Act's most positive legacy has been it's advanced that debate from whether to address campus violence at, and looking at how to address it. And he said in one of our events we did at Lehigh University, colleges and universities are now more focused on solving problems than admitting one exists. And that certainly is, is true from our organizational history in, in the start of the organization. Um, our organization was adversarial by nature, was often referred to as a watchdog. And it's really evolved, particularly in the last five years, because there's now a focus of people just wanting, craving that institutional support and wanting to know how to address it, how to best serve their students. And, and I know that's why a lot of the grantees with the campus program apply for that grant, because it's a lot of work. But what comes out of it is having a holistic program that is sustainable, that is not one person that addresses um, violence and sexual violence on campus. And Abby talked about institutional responsibility. There has to be that coordination from the top. And does your president or chancellor have to be at all meetings and have to be deeply involved? No, but they have to know it exists and they have to talk about it, as should your board of trustees or board of directors of the institution. There should be some sort of program on Cleary, Title IX, um, violence against women, sexual violence, domestic violence, dating violence, they should be aware of the efforts. So where do you go? I, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming um, with the VAWA amendments to Cleary or Campus Save as we informally are calling it. Um, I know that I, I can, I don't want to speak for Abby, but a large percentage of my day or when I'm at programs presenting is focused on this um, and it's focused at um, kind of nervousness around the obligations, especially in a post Dear Colleague letter world after the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. So first you really want to evaluate your compliance. Um, step back, look at what systems are in place, start a team. If you don't have a team already talking about Cleary or if you have a Title IX team, um, those teams should not um, exist separately. You should really sit back, Bring a team together from different uh, multidisciplinary multidisciplines on your campus and evaluate what you're doing already. Look at your annual security report. Look at what measures you have in place. 
consider what you would do if you haven't already responded to a case of domestic violence on campus. Build a team. So build a team that's committed to working on this. Before the regulations come out, and the final regulations we can expect sometime after April 2014, I would suspect possibly the fall based on um, um, precedent, but build a team before and start to think about these things because you probably have been responding to them and, and putting some measures in place and you really just want to step back and look at what could possibly happen. And if you have questions through that, please uh, let us know because again, one of the reasons we um, we're nominated to negotiated rulemaking is to bring what we're hearing from people who we serve and it's a variety of different constituencies so that's important. Coordinate your efforts. Um, use, and I, I've got a couple of que uh, uh, questions here. Um, I know that is probably referred to by a lot of um, folks as an unfunded mandate um, and can you with a $50,000 dollar budget out a great prevention program and and some great things absolutely but you can on a limited budget there are a lot of options that are out there that are of no cost um, and I would really if you haven't built that partnership with your local uh, victim service agency domestic violence organization rape crisis center build that relationship um, I, I imagine most of the time and certainly funding's been cut across the board but there is funding specific to prevention education and outreach there are things you can do together you can build a consortium of local colleges if there are other colleges in your area um, same type or different type if it's a two-year institution and you're a four-year institution it's still worth it to maybe meet twice a year and to talk about what you're all doing share challenges it, it's, it's a helpful way learn from colleagues um, one of my favorite things about higher education is sharing. Um, there, there really is not a need to reinvent the wheel. Um, I know that over the years I've collected when I see something at a presentation or when I'm out at uh, NASPA for Student Affairs Administrators or IACLEA, um, which is a campus law enforcement administration, whenever I go to trainings I always see something amazing and ask if we could take if I could look at it and if they would share it with me and if I could have permission to share it and I don't think I've ever had someone say no. Um, so really learn from colleagues and then put the steps in place before rulemaking happens. So think of that Department of Education good faith effort. Look at what's required of the Dear Colleague letter of Title IX. Look at what is required by Cleary now and what's coming down the pike with SAVE. List them out and really kind of sit with the team and determine what do we need to work on. Where are we lacking? What experts do we have on our campus? And they may be housed in academic departments who we can reach out to to help us with this process. And I know there were a number of different questions coming in, so I just wanted to address some of the um, some of the different questions and reiterate that if there are questions that um, for some reason we missed, we didn't respond. I know that that we've been um, answering some individually, but if there are any questions following the webinar that you feel as though were not answered or you still need some additional insight, our contact information is on the screen. Please always feel free to reach out to us. And we'll also, as Amy mentioned in the beginning, we'll try to put together a list of a, a number of these different questions um, so that we can share that more broadly in case there are folks who are not able to attend. We'll also be sharing the recording with all of you. So if you want to go back and kind of sit with a, a certain part, or if you want to view it again with some colleagues or with that um, collaborative team, if you have it in place on your campus, you'll have that as an option. Um, one of the questions was in relation to, well, what about if this crime occurs off campus, so it's not in our Clery geography at all, do we still have an obligation to respond or are there still requirements? So recognizing um, it, it's important to note that the Campus Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, even up until this point, came into play even if necessarily there there could be incidences that didn't fall within your Clery geography, but certainly um, involve your students and you would still be required to give those rights and give those options related to, for example, change of academic and living situation and some of the other um, procedures that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so you certainly would still need to respond um, even if the, the incident did not occur on your campus. Um, how that will be in Included for the purpose of statistics, as Allison mentioned, um, we'll have a lot more information regarding counting after negotiated rulemaking. 
Another question, which I thought was um, a really great question is, well, this is included within the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. So if we have a male, if we have male only school, male only population, does it apply to us? So these amendments fall under Cleary and the Cleary requirements. So even though it's included within the Violence Against Women Act, um, certainly it would apply to your campus, even if there are no um, females on that particular campus. Another question is where would CSAs go for training? And we always encourage you to really take a look at your campus and figure out how you can train campus security authorities based on your own particular policies and procedures. There are a lot of great other um, people who you can connect with for training. Our organization can certainly help you, help guide you through that process and give you some resources. But recognizing that what that reporting structure looks like can vary from institution to institution. So you wanna make sure that when you are providing training, when you are providing information, that it's catered to your specific campus. And this really goes hand in hand with another question that we received, which was, are there any model policies available? Now, we mentioned that with um, the Stalking Resource Center, they have a model campus stalking policy. One thing we always try to reiterate, though, is that when you look at policies, when you look at any sample policy, you really want to, one, evaluate whether or not it's in compliance with a number of these regulations, not just Title IX, not just Cleary, but all of them. But two, make sure that it fits your particular campus. Um, a story I've shared with others is that some colleagues at Department of Education have shared that there have, been uh, there have been instances where they're at an institution and they're looking at a policy and they see another institution's name in the middle. So we know that that, that means that some of that was pulled directly from the other college or university. That is not to say that it is not good to share information and to talk about what you're seeing at your institutions and what's working and what's not working. So I think we can learn a lot from other colleges and universities, but it's really important to take that and to apply it to your own campus. And excuse us as we take a moment just to look at some of these other final questions that are coming in. I'm looking to, I did answer a lot of them. Um, one was asked about sanctions. Do we have to list sanctions in the annual security report, all sanctions? And you do need to include those sanctions. Your policy and the ASR should have those sanctions included. Another question was, would off-campus stalking, domestic violence, sexual assault be, need to be counted by the college? If it is not in Cleary geography, it's not included in the Cleary statistics. However, um, and this is why we like to say often look beyond the statistics, because Cleary does require that you afford certain rights, and that's the Campus Sexual Assault Victim Bill of Rights, but to those students. So even though the, it may not have happened on the campus, um, if the uh, perpetrator is another student, then you definitely want to have those in place, especially because of Title IX pieces. And even if the perpetrator is not another student, you still want to offer certain, um, certain rights. So for example, switching residence hall, because maybe it happened in his or her residence hall room. So even if the student was a visitor, um, there may be some trauma associated with that room. So you want to make sure you kind of um, think about all of those possibilities. And some of the questions that are coming in are really talking about specific requirements. And um, as much as we hate to say, you know, we'll have to see, that's really the place that we are with some of it. So for example, when it comes to, to questions about specifically counting information, a lot of these places where um, we, we are trying to look to clarify, that information is going to be shared with the final regulation. So um, as much as we hate to say, hold on and, and we'll see, you know, it's coming down the pike, that's really the only answer that we can provide because the alternative would be to provide you with information that isn't accurate and is unclear, and that's not what we want to do. So what we are trying to do is give you the information that we know at this point, give you a starting point um, for what you should be taking a look at, but recognize that a lot of the specific information will be within those final regulations. Um, we had another question, so I just wanted to- Another question. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I just, we may be pulling the same question about requesting statistics from local law enforcement agencies, and you absolutely should. 
Um, you're in compliance if you simply request. If they don't send it to you, um, that's not, you do not have to hunt them down, so to speak. Um, you just, as long as you have proof that you requested that. But you do have to request that. And that includes the abroad programs. So um, anywhere where you have an area that's considered non-campus abroad, you want to request, um, per the Department of Education, you want to request in those areas. And as a reminder, we had a couple of people just um, send through, you know, we want to listen to this again. Are we going to be able to listen to this again? Or can we get a copy of the slides? You should have received the slides in an email um, from our colleague, Amy, who, who you met at the beginning of the webinar. If for some reason you didn't receive those, reach out to us and we'll make sure that they get to you. As for the recording, we will be sending that out once it's ready. Um, so, so you will receive that as well. A really good question that just came in is, are local law enforcement trained in Cleary and statistics gathering? Huh. Um, and really, that would really depend on the area. We actually had a training earlier this year where someone from um, the institution's local law enforcement came and sat through our day and a half Cleary training. That said, that's not always the case. So that's why it's really important when you're requesting statistics, give them as much information as possible as to what you're looking for. So what geography um, you're specifically looking for, what crimes are included, to make sure that they can provide you with that information if they're not familiar with Cleary. Because if they don't work within a campus environment, they might not have that type of training. And another great thing is some people are making suggestions for um, topics that they want to learn more about. So recognize that there are going to be um, a number of other webinars, especially through um, the campus program and through OVW. So please share with us. We're going to be sending um, all of you a, a survey to get some information about what you liked, what you'd like more of. So please always share that with us because we're always looking for places where we can offer more support to institutions. So that information is really helpful as we look at, well, what future resources should we develop? What, what future webinars are going to be most valuable? And a question was, um, where should we email? Allison's email is on there as well as my email. Feel free to, um, mine is aboyerclearycenter.org. Feel free to, to send an email um, to me. Or you're also going to be, as I mentioned, receiving an email that has the recording and some other information. So you'll be able to respond to that as well if that's easier. And one of the things that we're committed to is sharing information um, as often as possible throughout the process. So back in April, we did a webinar right after um, VAWA was passed in March to talk about some of the things coming down the pike. We plan to do that again um, once we do have the final regulations to, to share as much information as we have um, to, to help inform you all. So, so certainly, please stay connected, whether it's by email. Um, we, we are active on social media, Facebook, Twitter. So there's our plug for that. We're trying to get better at doing that. Um, so please just feel free to connect to us. We also have an um, email list on our website. So if you want to make sure that you're connected when we have more free resources um, that are available, if you want to make sure that, that you're on our mailing list, um, you can definitely connect that way. And one thing I might, I actually, I'll apologize to Abby because I'm telling her this for the first time in front of uh, um, close to 500 people on a webinar. We will probably do some sort of Twitter chat before negotiated rulemaking starts. Um, and we did that once when um, SAVE was in legislation. And it was really a great way to connect uh, uh, briefly and through the media about concerns and pieces and share resources. So I would look for that as well because it was a great, um, it was a great way for us to gather information as well. And I apologize, Abby, for sharing that idea with you the first time now. I always love Twitter chat, so I'm never opposed. 
uh, another question that came in um, was about a campus resource center. I believe that what we might have been talking about, if um, if you wanted some clarity, um, we did mention a couple of times the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. So I believe that that might be what we were referring to because we had mentioned that there are a number of different um, there are a number of different documents and and helpful things on there. And if you go into the chat section, um, you'll be able to to click on the link and you'll be able to access their website directly and some of the documents that they have related to bystander intervention. Okay, it looks like um, we're just giving it a couple more minutes in case there are any final questions that come in. And someone had a really good recommendation. They were saying it's really important to encourage everyone to be familiar with their state law requirements on these issues. California has a number of them, um, and that's a really excellent point. So making sure that you're connected not just with these requirements, but with other, um, other state requirements is, is certainly very, very important. The stalking resource that we mentioned was from the Stalking Resource Center. Um, and the resource that we mentioned was that they have a model campus stalking policy, which they do intend to update with the um, new regulations once that information is in place. So we really, one of the things we really want to do is um, thank the Office on Violence Against Women, OVW, for really, um, you know, stepping up as a leader, not only in providing funding to um, campus program grantees, but also in providing some of the information and not keeping it limited to the program grantees. So they really helped to make this webinar possible. Um, and this was one of two for the day. We had a, a huge participation in both um, from the higher education community. So. We're really grateful for them, and I know I would really encourage you to look out. They're going to do some other programs. While some programs are specific to those receiving grants, they are intending this year to do quite a few that reach out to others in the higher education community. So we're going to help advertise those as well as some other of their partners. Um, so we really are grateful to them, and thank you for joining us. And again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to send it to our email addresses. Um, give us a call. We're always happy to help in any way that we can. And we really appreciate you joining us and hope that you have a really wonderful afternoon.